time that I had a Brother Ray, Sister Barb come up. We're going to serve communion this morning. Lord God, we just thank and praise you for what you have done for us and how you sacrificed your son that we might be able to have life eternal. We thank you, Lord God, what you did at Calvary's cross. And we just thank you for your body shed for us, Lord God, because it was for our healing and for, you know, just for us and for our sin. Yes. We thank you, Lord God, that you did all this for us. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless the bread as we take it and eat it. And we just pray for the cup, Lord God, that we will remember your blood was shed for us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take it.
Let's keep this attitude of prayer and worship. I'm going to collect morning tithes and offerings. So if I could have my two ushers. Lord God, we thank you for an opportunity once again, Lord God, to give back to you a portion of what you have blessed us with. We ask you to bless it now in the name of Jesus. This morning, um, I'm so excited to have Brother John Finnessy, and I'm disappointed that I'll be over with the kids. I can't hear his message. I know it's great, and I know he has something in story for you from God. So I'm going to introduce Brother Finnessy. Come on up. Wherever you would feel comfortable. Can I bring this up? Of course. the four of you to come over to this side. <coughs> you want, do you want to hold it or you want to have them behind? That'll be just fine with me there. Thank you for your cooperation. Easter egg hunt, huh? Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go have the Easter egg hunt. <laughs> I play rough, okay? I'll knock you down. Eggs matter, okay? Eggs matter. Praise the Lord. Don't enjoy yourself. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Joy to be here again. Uh, I must share with you as I was in the midst of worship and uh, in praise. I, I have a sermon all put together here for you that I've worked on, and the Lord impressed me to speak on something else. So I'm going to go by the. I'm going to go with the desire of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to me, and I speak to you. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. It is a two-edged sword. We thank you for this day that we can gather in freedom of expression and freedom of praise. Oh, God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy in our lives. We thank you for your sacrifice. We pray, God, that you would come upon us and come to service. May my words be your words, God. May they sink deep and take hold within our hearts and minds. I will not fail to praise you. Today is Palm Sunday, and we call it Palm Sunday, but the Bible calls it Jesus' triumphant return to Jerusalem, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Triumphal means something was already won, does it not? You and I have the benefit of the work of the cross that we can see in retrospect what was to come and what took place. Interesting enough, they did not. They did not. I'd like to read for you out of Mark. All four Gospels reference and uh, discuss this event. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 11, if you have your Bibles or your cell phones. And it says here in chapter 11, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. That's the heading within my Bible. You are aware when the, the Gospels were written, they did not have chapters and verses. They were just long letters of what took place. And it wasn't until after the, after the, uh, the church was established that we began to have chapters and verse. And, and it's a joy that it is so that we can remember them and find them quickly. So in chapter 11 and verse 1, And as they approached Jerusalem 
and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and it will be, we'll send it back here shortly. They went out and found a colt on the side of the street and tied it at the doorway. As they untied it, some people said to them, standing there and asked, What are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it, and many others spread their excuse me, spread branches uh, that they had cut into the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed to him who hence comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest and bravest. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What an interesting <clears throat> interesting process. There's several things that really need to be captured here that I want to bring out. And I believe the Holy Spirit has impressed me to share with you. First and foremost, this is fulfillment of prophecy. Do you realize that the Christian, Judeo-Christian faith is the only faith that has prophecies that have been prophes prophesied and actually come true? Over 360 came true in Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ alone. In this particular instance, the gospel is fulfilled, the prophecy is fulfilled through Daniel, when Daniel himself prophesied of this occurrence. To the day when we see Jesus Christ entering Jerusalem, a very interesting clock starts ticking. You see, because it's, it's within a week that we see him crucified. Now, Jesus, being the Son of God, knew these things. He had already spent an evening in the Mount of Olives. He had already asked God, you know, you know, come upon me and, and be part of me. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and, and he was doing miraculous things. And he was feeding the, the poor and, and healing the sick. Not just long ago, in, in, if we look at Luke, it speaks in chapter 17, where he healed the lepers on his way to Jerusalem. You see, many times we think of Jesus Christ in the moment. But Jesus Christ is in, not just in the moment, but he's in the past, he's in the future. He knows what's coming. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when we look at the triumphal entry that we see how many people were excited about him coming. Are you excited about him coming? Amen. Amen. But how many of us, how many of us like they have been disappointed? Mm -hmm. What a difference a week makes. You can't talk about Palm Sunday without talking about Resurrection Sunday. Amen? You know, you, you hear about it, the, the premise of, uh, of his crucifixion on Friday, but come on, Sunday's coming. Okay? He may have been crucified on Friday, but Sunday is coming. We call it Good Friday because we know the end result of a resurrected Lord. Amen? He could not be resurrected if he had to die. And that's the glorious resurrection hope that you and I have as well. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that quickens our body, that will raise us as well. That is what we believe. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us unique. In the Christian faith, when we come to see Palm Sunday, there's so many things that I want to unpack here today. First and foremost is Jesus was obedient. Obedient to his father. You know, John 3.16, it tells us, And God so loved the world. You do realize it doesn't say, And Jesus so loved the world. Mm -hmm. God so loved the world. To point out the obedience of the son, believing and knowing that God's interest in his creation, which he created, was so great that he was faithful to the end. He knew what was coming. He was obedient. When we come to the, to, the, to the crowds coming to see him, they saw him as their king. 
they laid out palms, they laid out their cloaks, they laid out their clothing, they put it on the, on the road, they waved them, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the king. How many of you have been saved a long time? And when we first came to Christ, it was Hosanna, Hosanna. Yeah. Hosanna, Hosanna. But somewhere between his triumphal entry into our lives, life happens. Disappointment comes. Death, illness, Children who disappointed you as parents. You who are children who disappointed your parents. Regrets. What a difference a week makes. The people that came to see him, that were there at the triumphal entry, that laid their cloaks on the ground, that waved the palms, these were the same people that they saw and that he saw through the months prior, through the three years prior. They, this wasn't a new event. This wasn't like, well, who's that coming to town? They knew. They knew. They knew that he was in the Mount of Olives. They knew that he was in the garden. They knew that he was coming. They said, look who's coming. He's on his way. And the world around us is dying. They don't realize who's coming. They don't realize there's going to be another triumphal entry. But he won't be coming as the Savior. He'll be coming as the judge. So back to our person says they honored and worshipped him and praised him. And they put down their clothes. They put down the palms. And they waved them and waved them. They thought he was going to change their world. But they thought it was going to change them their way. Many times we come to Christ. Many times the world looks at Jesus. Many times people think of Christ as this, this Santa Claus. If I pray, then I'll get it. If I, if I do the right things, then I'll be rich. I'll be happy. All my prayers will be answered. I'll have a great marriage and I'll have a great relationship. My kids will be wonderful. And no one will get sick and no one will die. And I'll make a lot of money and I'll drive a nice car and live in a nice house. All those things can happen. But I'm here to tell you more often than not, they do not happen. Oh, yes, we, we are blessed beyond words. And I can't count all the blessings in my life. And if you compare me to others, sure, financially and physically and, and uh, you know, tangibly, yes. You know, the things of the world, sure, there's a lot of people with a lot more than I have. But I am blessed beyond words. And it comes to a maturity of understanding who Christ was. The people thought he was coming to overthrow Rome. Here's the new king. He's performed miracles. He's healed people. Raised people from the dead. He's going to do it. We're no longer going to be in bondage. We're no longer going to struggle. How many of us got saved in the understanding that Jesus Christ come into my life, you're my Savior, my Lord, and yet there were still struggles in our lives? Amen. Whether it's with language or sex or lying or gossip or, you know, insecurity, we still had things and still do mm -hmm. within our lives that God and only God can change. Amen. And he only has changed them to the degree they've been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. When we come to accept him for who he was. And who he is. Do you still wave the palm? Do you still say Hosanna, Hosanna. Great is the Lord. Life is hard. And it was hard for these persons. They were oppressed. They were in bondage. We live in a world that is dying to bondage. Bondage of poverty. Bondage of political correctness. Bondage to fake news. I'm here to tell you that the world is in chaos. It's only in Jesus Christ that we have normality and understanding. It's only when we look in the Bible and see the true word of God. You know, truth is not subjective. We live in a, in a postmodern culture. That is, that is, truth is relative. It's all about how I feel. It's about the emotion. You know, this, yesterday, they had this tremendous outpouring of concern with gun control and things of that nature. And admittedly, there needs to be control, but it's on the part of the individual. Amen. Take away the guns and they'll use hammers. Take away the hammers, they'll use knives. Don't get me wrong, you can kill a lot of people with one gun, I get it. And there are loopholes and things that need to be corrected. But it's all about emotion. It's how you feel, and, and we can't offend them, and we can't hurt anyone's feelings. Jesus himself, Jesus himself is a rock. 
that makes people stumble. The stone that we break ourselves against. You see, when we come to Christ, when the people of Jerusalem saw him entering in, they thought he was going to do this. And how often God does that. He doesn't do this because we want him to do this. He does this because he is a righteous God. He is holy. He is true. He has a plan and a purpose for each of us. For each of us as individuals, for every person living in this world, if they would come to him, he just has a plan and a purpose that only he can fulfill. You and I come to Christ and we see him on this Jerusalem road. And we wave our palm, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then life doesn't turn out like we want it. We have issues. We lose jobs. We lose loved ones. You raise children in a Christian home, in a Christian environment, and problems come in, the world creeps in, their attitudes, drugs, sex, monies, things distract them and take them away. And we say, God, you know, you, you came into my life in such a triumphant way, and we believe in you so very much. But I got to tell you, from Sunday to Sunday, it's kind of a hard struggle. And this is what occurred in Jerusalem. What a difference a week makes. You can't talk about Palm Sunday and not talk about resurrection. Now, we call it Easter. Uh, the young kids are going out and having an Easter egg hunt. Who doesn't like an Easter egg hunt? Amen? I like it, especially when we put money in the egg. You hear what I'm saying? I can't tell you how many eggs I found at my house like a year later or two. It's bad. Chocolate melted. It's no good. You chew them up in the lawnmower. You know, we've all seen that happen. I digress. We think of the resurrection, we call it Easter. Easter is a bit of a compromise between the pagan and the culture of Christianity. Eggs being fertility, rabbits, all of that. You do realize that's where that comes from. You might want to look that up. But you and I know it's about the resurrection. But the resurrection wouldn't have happened if Good Friday didn't happen. And we call it Good Friday when Jesus Christ is murdered and killed and crucified. And we call it a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. <laughs> And yet they, they, they demand his crucifixion on Friday. Have you been so disappointed with God at times you just said, I'm done. This isn't what I signed up for. My life's been kind of crappy. I don't mind that word, but sometimes life's just crappy. And it's hard. And sometimes it's hard for days, weeks, and months. The people of Jerusalem felt no different. What do you mean you're not going to overthrow Rome? What do you mean you're going to get rid of Herod? What do you mean you're not going to return Israel back to its people? What do you mean you're not going to clean out Jerusalem of all the crime and all the people that are here? They don't belong here. All the foreigners, all of the, the people who've come in and indulged themselves in Jerusalem, all the, all the abuses that God's chosen people have suffered. What do you mean you're not going to change that? You're not going to make it better? Well, this isn't what I signed up for. You see, Christianity, our, our salvation experience, when we come to Christ and we ask him to come into our lives and we accept him as our Lord and Savior, he changes us from the inside so we can deal with the outside. You see, the Jerusalem wanted them to change the outside so they feel better on the inside. Amen? Now, this is, a, this is kind of a paradox, but most of the world's that way. What can you do for me? What is the world going to fix for me? These young people and all these people marching against guns and things. What is the government going to do for me? I'm here to tell you, until you do something for yourself, no one outside is going to make a difference. There's no law. There's no change. There's no restriction. There's no consequence that is greater than the the change that takes place in your life. The change that takes place in your person as a young man, a young woman, as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's when we see that change. In, in Corinthians, it tells us that I'm a new creation. The old things are cast away and all things are made new. Paul writes that we need to have the renewing of our mind on a regular basis by reading his word, washing it with, when we read this. When we read the scriptures to say, okay, God, 
I don't understand. But I'm not so naive in the saying that I don't understand that I can't learn. And if I don't understand it, I find someone who does. And then I seek it out further. And I, and I look into your word. These are love letters of knowing who God is and what he wants us to do in our lives. The people at Jerusalem, when he came in, waving the palms, needed rescue. They needed redemption. They needed salvation. All the things that Christ had to offer. But he doesn't work in our time. He doesn't work in our mindset. We've all lived long enough to be disappointed. We've all lived long enough to have stories that we all can share. Uh, you know, you can talk about the car breaking down and the washer breaking down and no money in the bank to fix either one. You can talk about losing your job. You can talk about your child being sick and hearing you don't have insurance to cover what needs to be fixed. I mean, it goes on and on. And everyone has a story. If you live any kind of life, Things happen. You know, in the, in the story Saving Nemo, did you ever see that movie? Finding Nemo. It's a beautiful cartoon, and the, the father fish, the little fish gets captured, and the little father fish tries to track him down. And, and there's a line in that movie where he says, I don't want anything to ever happen to him. And Dory, the little blue fish, says to him, well then, if you don't want anything to ever happen to him, then nothing will ever happen then he'll never learn. He'll never grow. You know, this is what life's about, that you and I grow. And as we grow, we come to understand who Jesus Christ really is. I think it's really fair to say that, that when we were young people, we didn't appreciate what our parents went through to be parents, especially until you have children of your own. If you haven't had children, uh, I, I, I hope you understand the, the correlation. But when you have to get out, you have to work, you have to budget your monies. You have bills to pay. People who get on your nerves. People you love and friends who disappoint you. And yet your parents or people who care for you, whether it be an aunt, a grandmother, a grandparent, an uncle, someone loved you enough to take care of you and make you an adult. There's a, a very popular psychologist right now who, uh, who has some tremendous insights to the, the human psyche, and his name is Jordan Peterson. And one of the things he says, one of his famous quotes right now is, no one really ever grows up until they love something more than themselves. Isn't that true? I mean, you never really grow up until you can love something more than yourself. Teenagers aren't grown up, are they? No, they're not, because all they think about is themselves. <laughs> and it's, it's a natural progression. The people of Jerusalem loved themselves very much. And they saw the Savior of the world coming, but they didn't see him as the eternal Savior. They saw him as an earthly Savior. They saw him as the God of this earth changing the outward circumstances. Okay? The outward circumstances. We're going to pass laws. We're going to give out money. We're going to give out food. We're going to give out mortgage. We're going to give out, and you can fill in the blank. Yet it doesn't change the person. It doesn't change the sin nature. It doesn't change who man is. What does change is a miraculous, radical experience an introduction to the Lord and Savior, the creator of all things, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Messiah to the Jew, and the Savior to the Gentile, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Hosanna! You and I must come to see him as he really is. And then it changes our perspective. It, it's, it's the same kind of thing when we pray. Prayer changes things, but more often than not, it changes our perspective. It really does. Amen. It, Lord, my car is broke. After you pray, your car is likely still broke. Father God, I don't have any way to pay this bill. After you pray those kind of prayers, it's likely you do not have any new money in the bank. But it changes your perspective. He helps us to stop focusing on the problem and focus on the problem solved. 
You hear what I'm saying? You know, we need to look for Christ in all things. We need to see him in all things. We need to see him as the people in Jerusalem saw him coming in. The triumphal king. But you see, through life and through disappointment, people change. People change, and it's not always for the better. How did that old man become so mean and nasty? How did that lady become so, so lonely and so tired all the time? How did that middle-aged guy be so nasty to his kids? And why is he always stressed out? Life happens, and it doesn't happen overnight. It took a week for these people to change. Once they realized he wasn't going to overturn the things that needed to be overturned. Of course, there were uh, political uh, ramifications and politics play a role in so many things, even within the church. And so they said, hey, you know, he can't overthrow, he can't upset the table, he can't turn the boat, whatever you want to call it. So they, uh, they devised a way to persecute him, to arrest him, to eventually crucify him. And it stands to reason many of the people that waved their palms and said, Hosanna is the king. We're in the same place. Crucify him. Crucify him. You see, we have a lot of people in the world, and I don't believe anyone's in this church like that. But we have a lot of people in the world who say they know who Jesus is, but they don't know who Jesus is. They know him as a figure. They know him as a person. They may even know him as the son of God, but they don't have a personal relationship with him. It's in those moments that we change. How many of us say, well, if, if God was real, why was there violence? And if God was real, why didn't he save those children in the school? And if God was real, why didn't he do this? And if he's a good God. And if he's a good God, why, why? You don't ever hear them question when God gives them a raise. When God saves them from a car accident. When God saves those children from being shot because somehow, some way, he changed the heart and mind of a person before it happened. You know, we don't hear that. We don't hear what a good God he was today, that he saved my child, or that what a good God he was today, that I got a bonus. What a good God he was today, that my car worked and got me to work on time, and that I woke up and was able to take a breath. What a great God. No. No, we only give God our, our crumbs and our penalties and our problems, and we complain now. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus entering Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna to the king. What a difference a week makes. What a difference a life makes. Are you struggling today? Is life been hard? I think we all have a story. And unfortunately, many of us have a lot of stories. I believe with all my heart, if you don't know Jesus Christ, today is that day that he wants to have a triumphal entry into your life. That he wants you to, to wave the palm and say, Hosanna, Hosanna. And allow him to come in and change your world as he desires. You see, change is difficult. It's also exhilarating, but it's very difficult. When we come to that place of change and God says, you can't do that anymore. I'd rather you consider it in a different way. You can't treat your kids that way. You can't treat your loved ones that way. You need to stop doing drugs. You need to stop cursing. You need to stop gossiping. And you say, well, I can't do that. No, you can't. Only the power of Jesus Christ can do that. Only an understanding that you are now a new creation. That God's come in and he's doing an overhaul. But you can't, you can't let him only have portions of your house. You can't only give him portions of each room and say, ah, I hold the key to that room, God. You can't get in there. That hurt me way back when. When I was when I was seven and I was molested, or when I was fifteen and, and my father left, or when I was eighteen and my mother told me I was no good and no good thing could come out of me. And, and when I was twenty one and they told me you're fired and I, and don't come back and, and we store and hide all these things in compartments within our lives. And God says, No. I hold the keys to death and hell. My son Jesus Christ lived, breathed, died on the cross, is resurrected again, that he may live eternally in you. 
And I've given you the Holy Spirit to overcome. And I've given you the Holy Spirit to unlock those doors. That in every case, in every situation, you can see that I was working. And that I am real. And I'm working today. And I want to cleanse your mind. And I want to refresh with that, that, terrible, that terrible thing that happened in your life. And I want to remove it. I want to remove the pain. And I'm going to remove the unforgiveness. And I'm going to remove the bitterness. And I want to set you free from the ownership of those terrible things. I hold the keys of death and hell. I need you to give me the key to death. Amen. You see, when the people came to him in Jerusalem and they waved the palm, they thought he was going to do it all. He's going to change everything and now my life is better. What he changes is each of us individually. He changes us deep inside where no man, no woman can touch. He comes into our minds and he renews them on a regular basis. And the Holy Spirit, when you and I come to Christ, he comes in and he says, there is a new sheriff in town and we have a new attitude and a new life and a new hope. And when you and I do things that are not godly, when they're fleshly and we all do them, the Holy Spirit he pricks us. He pinches us. He whispers in our ear and says, that's not right. What you just said is not good. How you behave is not good. You shouldn't look at that on the computer. You shouldn't watch that on the television. You shouldn't treat that person that way. Notice I didn't say you're not worthy. I didn't say you're no good. I didn't even say you're not a Christian. I said, that's not right. The Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives on a regular basis and he only could come after Jesus entered Jerusalem. What a difference a week makes. What a difference a week makes. So as I close, has Jesus entered your life triumphantly? Do you know him as your Savior? You've already heard me tell you, if you don't, you need to. And if you do, and if you already have, you already know that troubles come. Life happens. Unless you're going to sit in a box in the house and go nowhere. You know, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was Chuck Swindoll. Many of us get in these things called ruts. You know, Chuck's. Chuck Swindoll, I believe, says, a rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. You hear what I'm saying? A rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. Many of us have been in a rut a time or two of our life. You may have heard them as traps. Men get trapped in seasons of pornography or depression. Women, depression or, or loneliness. And it takes the hand of God many times to another parishioner, a fellow friend, a girlfriend, a husband, to reach into that rut and pull us out. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ reached into time itself. He entered time itself to change history that you and I could be changed for eternity. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, he walks in. He rides, rather, on the coal. Has he ridden into your life? Have you accepted him? I want to challenge you today. If you haven't, I want to pray with you. Change your life forever. But just like in Palm Sunday, just like in the story, just like history has it in our Bible, in a week's time, people change their mind. But they didn't have the advantage that you do. You see, we have it written down. We know the end of the story. Amen? Amen. We have an understanding that they did not. Do not think, do not be critical of the Jew and the and the Israelites and the people that lived back then. They were people like you and I. Amen. We are swayed by stories and hurts and inconsistencies in society, and we say, How did that happen? Well, I'm well, I'm not gonna go. And I'm not gonna listen, and I'm gonna do what I are we so different. I pray this day that you know Jesus Christ, that this Palm Sunday may be the Sunday he enters your life triumphantly. To 
There's two kinds of people. Those persons who need to see him. And there's two persons. The second person is the person who has seen him. And like the people of Jerusalem, you've been disappointed. You might spend a little more than you care for talking about. You may even have crucified him within your own life. You know, oh, no, 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 that's just wrong. No, no. Oh, you come to church, you profess to be the Christian, but he's not alive and well in your life. Satan has stolen your joy. He has stolen your peace. He's stolen your productivity. And in effect, that's what happened here. Satan came in and he stole these people's joy. He stole their perspective. And in a week's time, they cried, crucify him. If he doesn't fix it how I want, then I don't want anything to do with him. If that's you today, I want to pray with you as well. You may not wish for crucifixion, the crucifixion of Christ over again, but you feel like he's kind of dead in your life. You need a resurgence. You need a regeneration, if you will. He's here today. He is that triumphal entry, and he is that resurrected Lord. He is our blessed hope, and he does have the answers to all our problems. Many times those answers aren't what we want to hear. Many times the answer is the problem is you. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. It's never him. I hope you look at Palm Sunday a little differently today. Did he come into your life triumphantly? Is he still king of kings and lord of lords? Would you still wave the palm? Or was he a celebrity? And you just kind of latched onto him while you could, and he's cool, and you know, I do that church thing, but he's not my lord. Or even further, you, you see him as your Lord, or at some point in your life you did. But today, sitting here in church, it's more like, you know, all that. I got other things to do. I hope it's not any of the latter. I hope you see him as your risen Lord. I hope you see him as the King of Kings. I hope in your heart of hearts you cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. It is a two-edged sword. Palm Sunday. God, you fulfilled prophecy from Daniel to the day with his entry into Jerusalem. Father God, you have a plan and a purpose for all of us. And God, many times it doesn't occur, it doesn't account, it doesn't even seem to remotely look like what we had hoped. But you are the potter and we are the clay. Who are we to challenge you on what we should be and how we should be made? Help us, O oh God, to surrender ourselves to you, to your purpose, and to your plan in our lives. Help us, O oh God, to see you as our Lord and Savior, as the King of Kings, and, and, and wave the palm and say, Hosanna, Hosanna. I pray, God, for every person in the sound of my voice that they know you as their Savior, and if they don't, that they seek you out. That, God, they may seek me out that I may share who you are with them and they may know you as their Savior. I wish also, God, to speak to those this day in the sound of my voice that know you but are not in fellowship with you. They've been disappointed. Life's been hard. There's been hurts and hang-ups and addictions and difficulties. Father God, I will speak to them and let them know that you wish to restore them, that you haven't failed and that you haven't abandoned them that you are the Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings, and that, God, you wish for them to know you as their Savior. We'll not be able to praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I was really hoping this could play some music instead of mood, but <laughs> it's kind of where it went. There's some palms out front, and... Uh, I encourage you to take one home and uh, hang it over a picture or make it into a cross or fold a piece into your Bible that you can have something tangible to hold on to. And think about the people waving them, what that must have looked like, carrying them out of the trees, laying them on the ground, 
would you take your coat off, the, lay it on the ground so a, a small donkey or a small horse could walk over it with their dirty hooves, possibly cut it, tear it up? Would we do that for the Lord? What a difference a week makes. Amen? Amen. Thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you. God bless you.